Hello, welcome to you all to another episode of the series about Gabrielle Delan, where we have the opportunity to get to know some of his wonderful works. And today we have with us our dear friends, Rafael Caldas. Hello, Rafael. Hello. Hi, Muni. How are you doing? Yeah, not too bad, thanks. Yourself, how are things? Very good, very good. Very excited. Very good. We're very happy to have you here with us today, Rafael. Thanks for accepting the invitation. It's very, very nice to be together talking about this wonderful work by uh, Gabriel Delan. My pleasure. So for, yeah. So for those who don't know Rafael, Rafael was born and raised in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. And since childhood, he um, is a member of the Spiritist Center Antonio de Aquino and Leon Denis. So he lives now in the United Kingdom, in London, to be more, more precise. And he's a member, a very active member of the Spiritist Society of London, SSL, a trustee of the British Union of Spiritist Society. And he's also engaged into different types of uh, work as well. I won't mention here because you know, he's also um, you know, very much involved in the Spiritist movement in the UK. It would take some time, but... We are looking forward to seeing Raphael's presentation. So, Raphael, again, a warm welcome, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. I want to say, first of all, thank you to you, and thank you to Elsa in the background for the invitation. Um, the, you mentioned like the being involved in the you know the, the, the min, many activities, initiatives uh, in the UK about uh, spiritism, but in reality, it's just me trying to learn and just sharing my journey with people, right? I'm just uh, trying to investigate and understand uh, as much as possible um, about spiritism. And I was very happy to receive this invitation. Let me bring my slides here. Um, I was very, very happy to receive this invitation from, from both of you um, because... In the last kind of few years, I've been life has given me the opportunity of studying and a bit more about um, mediumship specifically, study and work with mediumship specifically. And up to this point, up until this year, I've heard about Gabriel Delan, but I never really studied his work. Um, so it was very handy to have this uh, opportunity this year. Um, and why, why, why do I say that? Gabriel Delan is uh, like a lot of respect for him. He is such a, a scientist, let's say, um, really dedicated a lot of his life to um, investigating the phenomena, investigating mediumship. Um, and the interesting about his work is that there was always a very strict and heavy, serious and scientific element to everything that he was studying. Um, in this specific book, let me go back to the other, to the other one. And so we're going to talk about the, 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 the materialized apparitions of the living and the dead. So this is a, this is two books, part um, a literature. Uh, the first part, he focuses on the, the apparitions of the living. The second part, apparitions of the dead. And the interesting thing about uh, uh, this book is that since the beginning, Gabriel uh, Delan sets the tone uh, of what the book is about. Uh, he starts the book and his introduction with five quotes from five different philosophers. Uh, Francois Arago, as he's a mathematician, Henri Poincaré, Poincaré, I think that's how you say it, uh, the Marquis de Laplace, Montaigne, and Kant. And I brought one of the, the quotes here um, from uh, Henri Poincaré. To doubt everything or to believe everything, these are two equally convenient solutions which one and the other exempt us from thinking. Why? I think this is such a powerful way of starting the, the book because from the introduction in the very beginning, he's already challenging us, inviting us to reflect about our position in life. He's not even talking about the content of his studies yet. He's talking about our position in life, especially if we are people of science, but regardless, 
how careful we need to be to affirm that something is or is not a certain way. Um, and that is to remind us uh, readers that in any field of research, and I will repeat, any field of research um, can and should be studied by a scientific method. His ambition with these studies was described in these two books was to establish that we are not only composed of physical matter that can be studied in the same procedures as those who study matter. And what are those scientific procedures? Experience, experiments, and observation. But one of the problems back then, that to be very honest with you, still remains to this day, is that people are quick to associate these topics to mysticism, to fantasy. Um, we ignore that many scientists dedicated a lot um, to study these topics from a purely scientific perspective. A lot of them started these investigations exactly to try to prove that you know, it was trickery or fraud, that it wasn't possible. Um, and we see that all of them that truly dedicated time to try to investigate this from a serious and scientific perspective end up changing their minds at the end of the day because they cannot deny what they uh, saw from a, a controlled environment in terms of uh, testing. So Gabriel Delan goes on to say that he is not the pioneer in this subject and he lists multiple names that came before him. I bring a few names here just for us to kind of uh, place ourselves um, in time. These are not all cases that he's, he mentions, some of them. Um, Sir William Crookes was a physicist from the Royal Society in the UK and have Alfred uh, Russell Wallace, a naturalist also of the Royal Society. Sir Olivier Lodge, another physicist also in the UK in the Royal Society. I have Lombroso, which is an Italian criminologist that dedicated a lot of uh, experimentation uh, in these areas as well in Italy. Richard Hodson, Hod Hodson uh, member of the Society of Physical Research in the USA. Um, Nicolas Camille Framayon, founder of the Society Astronomique de France. All scientists, and I said before, after dedicating Invest, um, investigating the phenomena for many, many years, um, found themselves converted at the end of it. One interesting uh, um, comment I'm going to make here is Sir William Crookes, the first one. He was widely insulted, ridiculed for his studies in this field. Um, he was publicly called mentally deranged, which is something people also jump into and say, oh, no, this person lost their plot, right? If they are saying that these things are truly lost their plot. Sir William Crookes, went on after his investigation in this field to discover the cathode rays, which are, uh, which paved the way for the X-ray. Just so make sure that, you know, we have things in place, that they are not deranged. Uh, there were still big references in their fields. Anyways, um, as much as science is unassailable when it establishes the facts, it is miserably prone to error when it comes uh, to claims that to establish negations. What is the idea behind this book? Delaney explains that there isn't actually any new findings from a spiritualist or a spiritist perspective. But what he does is he does a, a review in the literature, in all of the investigations that happen around this subject around the world. So he gets experiments from the US, France, Italy, Germany, UK, Finland, Germany, Russia, all over. And he organizes everything that was already published. Um, they describe the phenomena in a logical order. And he brings a lot of examples in details on all of these uh, discoveries. He gives a quick explanation of different types of phenomena, um, mechanical writing, mediumship trance, clairvoyance, and uh, spirit photography. But then he goes into dive uh, in materialization. But he starts by exploring everything that is done in these sessions. Something that is quite funny to see throughout the whole uh, two books is that he's always going back to 
how do we make sure that these phenomena that we are seeing, this specific case, is not fraud or not a hallucination or is not caused by something else? He's always he always brings those elements into the analysis that that he makes. Uh, but anyways, he starts exploring everything that is done in these sessions that sets it up, sets it up as a uh, scientific investigation. Um, so the materialization sections, as we, we call it, we're going to see them in, in more detail. Usually they have a standard format. So you have a medium is either sitting in front of a table or behind a table, or sometimes next to a cabinet or something we call the cabinet. Um, the cabinet being just an empty space in the room, separated from the rest, either by a curtain or doors, maybe, usually in a corner. Sometimes uh, there'll be objects on the table or in the cabinet, like a bell or a musical instrument. Um, once everything is arranged, the mediums enter in trends and the manifestations start. Many things happen um, when these, uh, the, the manifestations start. It can be the movement of curtains, objects levitating, people, body parts appearing, um, light force moving in the room. And there have been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of experiments registering the same um, kind of phenomenon. Now, whenever we talk about these things, for some reason, it automatically inspires an involuntary mistrust. And that's when the Miguelan goes in to describe the multiple ways um, people would make sure that these effects were not a trick or not a fraud. So the medium keep their hands visible on top of the table the whole time, or their hands will, and legs will be held by assistant or by other investigators. Um, sometimes they'll be tied to the chair, make sure there was no mechanism that they could control. The rooms themselves, windows, doors will be sealed from inside, make sure no one else entered. During the, the sessions, um, the investigators would move around to make sure that there wasn't anything uh, out of place so nobody uh, entered the room somehow. They would probe the walls, the ceiling, the floor, the cupboard. The other thing that he relied on, this was all around like, the, the second half of 1800s, the participation of people of science that had a respectable reputation to validate those experiments. People that were not related to the medium, people that were not related to anyone else that was um, involved. But there was an additional issue. Um, all of these sessions, or a lot of them, the, 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 they had better results when things were in the dark. Um, later on, we, just, we found out that the, the luminous vibrations like of light, normal light, have a dissolving action in these materializations, at least in the beginning of them, when they are not... Um, let's say solidified or calling this consolidated enough to um, offer resistance to light. Um, so only after a lot of training, a lot of setup, a lot of multiple experiments and harmonization of the room and medium and, and so on, you'd be able to get more light uh, into the, the tests. Anyway, so the lens starts re revisiting the literature, as I said, um, guiding us through multiple examples and he starts, first of all, bringing the case of telepathic action. So before he goes in to say, oh, this and this person are just showing up, he, he starts to look at, is telepathic action um, a thing? Does it happen? How does it work? So he would see the experiments made by the English Society of Psychic Research, where they ran multiple tests, where one person was in one room, someone else was in a different room, sometimes in a different building. And they had a set of images or ideas that they needed to pass on to this other person in the other room. And the person would have register those things and then they would compare. I have some images here just to bring some of the results that, that happened from those experiments. Um, so what you see here is just a, a, a picture side by side of what was the, should have been the original one and what was the image perceived by the person on the other room or in the other building without any contact, without, you know, being part of anything. Um, and this started to, to give us a bit of an indication in terms of there is an element of thought or ideas that are transmitted from one person to another that does not come through, you know, light or, or sound. What is that then? Something that is able to be perceived that is not perceived in our 
uh, using our um, physiological senses and organs. That was a, he started with the telepathic action because for the first time in science, we were observing this, the, the action um, of something without the intermediary of senses. Once this was established, we can exchange influence, uh, act upon people through thought. He moved on to the apparitions. And again, he goes on to look for the multiple cases published about people that had those experiences. Um, the example I'm going to bring here is an example also uh, from the English Society. Um, it's going to re let's read together. That's why I, brought, I know there's a lot of text, and uh, but let's let's read it together. So about the month of September 1873, my father was then living at 57 Inverness Terrace. I was seated one evening around eight o'clock thirty in the large dining room at the table facing me. With her back to the door was seated my mother, my sister, and a friend, Mrs. W., that I could see from the seat. She had on a purple dress. I rose, I rose to receive her, although I was very surprised, for I believed her to be Tenby. As I got up, my mother said to me, Who is there? Without having, at least I believe, seen someone herself, but seeing the movement that I had made, I exclaimed, But it's scary and I advanced to meet him. As I moved forward, the apparition disappeared. I inquired and learned that my wife was spending the evening with a friend and that she had a purple dress, which I had never seen. I had never seen her with a toilet of this color. My wife remembered that she was talking about me at the time with some friends and that they were very much regret my absence because we were going to dance and that I had a promise to make dance. I had been unexpectedly detained in London. I could remember that I was in a group of friends and that we regretted his absence. This is from Alex Abouman. It's just one of the examples, but, and I think the wording was a bit uh, lost in the translation, but anyways, uh, there were hundreds of them. Um, and it's still to this date. You don't really have to look much to find someone telling you a similar experience um, that, you know, oh, I was pretty sure I saw somebody, had this vision, somebody else, I was thinking of me or I was thinking of them and then they called or, you know, things like that. But again, the importance here lies on the questions about if our organs are sensitive to sound, light, etc. cetera. Um, but the clairvoyance makes it possible to see distinct scenes that happen miles away at night, despite walls, buildings. So it isn't the light reflecting on the situation that presents the phenomenon to us. It's not the physiological why who is perceiving the image. So it must be happening outside the brain. So to explain this, there's either three things. The thought of the agent now, is sending this image to, to the other one who is receiving it. Or the person who is having the, uh, looking at the image has a clairvoyant eyes that, that require this extraordinary hyper acuity to see things uh, that will not, they are not there. Or third, the receiver's soul is exteriorized and goes to the place um, perceived during the vision. Now, even though these were new experiments, the stories like that, as I said, are not new in human history. Even within the saints, we have encounters that give us examples of things like that. And I brought here another two examples. Um, so the first one, the first paragraph. Let's, let's take a look. The account of the Acts of the apostle, Apostles, which mentions the deliverance of St. Peter, makes us note that among the Hebrews, the belief in bicorporeality was accepted by the people. When Peter was delivered from his prison by the angel, and it is not out of place to note here that he himself did not believe what the angel was doing was real, but thought he had a vision. That it, he doubled, he doubted his senses and assumed to be a victim of a dream. When therefore he was delivered and went and knocked at the door of the house in which many of his friends were assembled, these said, when the maidservant who had been opened assured him that it was there. It is his angel. So they thought it was uh, an outside um, 
projection of him. We go to another one, St. Anthony, St. Anthony of Padua. He was in Spain when he suddenly fell asleep. The very day his father was in prison in Padua, accused of the murder of a child whose body had been found in his garden. St. Anthony appears before the judge, demonstrates his father's innocence, designates the real culprit, then disappears. While these events were taking place in Italy, it was established that St. Anthony had not left Spain. This example of St. Anthony, um, again, how, how do you explain these things? Uh, is it possible? Is it not? These are, these are stories that have been uh, well known in, in, in our recent history. This example of St. Anthony actually helped, helps us to link um, to what Delan moves his studies in. So after he established that the existence of these uh, effects, um, he was pretty much exploring the case of telepathic actions. Again, the perception of the cases were not perceived by people's physical eyes and ears. His next step was move to collective experiences. Describing case people have called their double or splitting. Um, and in many cases, even, even against their control. Because if you're talking about a single person having a vision, maybe it's something related to that person having the vision. Now, when you start talking about a collective experience, different questions start to pose themselves. So one of the most interesting cases that uh, he describes is the case of Miss um, Emily Saji. Um, that's described in the book Animism and Spiritism by Aksakov. Let's take a look at her case. Right. For about one year and a half, one of the mistresses, uh, so there was, sorry, let me go back to this. 1845, there was a boarding school in Riga, Latvia, well, today's Latvia, um, called New Elk. Um, and let's read the story. It was about one year and a half, and one of the mistresses that was 32 years old, Miss Emily Saji, a few weeks after she started, strange things started to happen before the students. When one said to have seen her in such a part of the establishment, another claimed to have met her elsewhere at the same time. One day, Emily Saji was giving a lesson to 13 of these young girls, including uh, Miss de Gusenberg, and when, to make her demonstration better understood, she was writing the passage to be explained on the blackboard. The, the pupils suddenly saw at their great fright, two Saji girls, one next to the other. They looked exactly like and made the same gestures. Only the real person had a piece of chalk in his hand and was actually writing, while his double, her double, had none and was content to imitate the movements she made to write. Another day, you didn't stop there. Another day when uh, Emily Saji was giving a lesson to 13 girls, Oh, sorry, that was the same one. <laughs> the last one is that one day all the 42 pupils were gathered in some room from, for embroidery work. The room was on the ground floor with four glass doors which opened directly into a garden. In the middle of the room, there was a large table before which the different classes usually assembled. The residents were all seated in front of the table where they could see the garden. While working, they saw Miss Saji picking flowers not far from the house. At the upper end of the table stood another mistress in charge of surveillance. At one point, this lady left and her armchair remained empty, but only for a short time. For the young girl suddenly saw the form of Miss Saji there. Immediately, they looked at the garden and saw her still picking flowers. Only her movements were slower and heavier, like someone sleepy or exhausted with fatigue. They looked up at the chair again, where the double sat, silent, motionless, but with such an appearance of reality that if they had not seen Miss Aji and had not known that she had appeared in the armchair without entering the room, they might have believed that it was her. Certain that they were not dealing with a real person, and somewhat accustomed to these strange manifestations, 
two of the more daring students approached the army chair and touching the apparition thought they met there a comparable resistance to that offered by a light fabric of muslin or crepe. One even dared to pass it in front of the armchair and actually crossed part of the form. Despite this, it lasted a little longer, then gradually faded away. It was immediately noticed that Miss G had resumed picking her flowers with her usual vivacity. The 42 boarders noticed the phenomenon in the same way. So there's a lot of observations from this case. First, this was shared by 42 different people. Same impression, same testimony. Then we have them interacting with the apparitions and telling us there was some resistance when touching it. So there's a material element to it. Another one, the fact that the agent, Miss and Melissa G, seemed weaker, tired, while the phenomenon was happening. This and other cases um, were spontaneous. Um, the land went to look um, at voluntary appearances, experiments of doubling as well. Uh, because the idea was, if those things are natural phenomena that can happen uh, without the control or the intention of these people, then that must be a natural effect. And if it's a natural effect, can be tested and should be tested in an experiment uh, situation. The other reason for trying to do these experiments was to try to create uh, an idea of casuality, right? The question was, could we, without prior agreement between you know, the operators, succeed in influencing a subject to produce a phenomenon? If this was successful, the cause and effect relationship would be there, would be evident. So you would be on a chosen day, specific time, appointed place, where B would see the apparition of A as A wanted it to produce. Um, up until this point, um, all of the cases that he had studied, there were three types of phenomena um, that were classifying those, those, those cases. First one was like what we call the veridical hallucination, where um, the idea, the vision is purely subjective. Um, there was an example that he gave um, about this gentleman um, in the United States that he lived in New Jersey, but had to go to work in New York, but he was very worried about his wife. He left his wife, who was, which was uh, ill. Um, and when he went to New York, to, he spent like the weekend, uh, a few days there to to work, he was very worried about the wife. So at night when he was in his hotel room, in his underwear, he was his, he sat down and was really thinking about her and saw her, kind of see, saw him, himself being uh, taken to, to his house and saw his wife um, a bit better, a bit more recovered, laying down, relaxed, um, make him feel better. A few days later, when he went back to his house, his wife was super upset and super worried about him because on that same night, on that same time, she had seen him. She has seen him walking into to the house, into her bedroom. He was not dressed in the same way. He was dressed in normal clothes. He wasn't in his underwear. Um, but she was sure that because of how vivid the experience was, something was wrong with him. Maybe he even had passed. Um, which goes back to when in the initial images that I showed that when we were talking about the telepathic experiments, when the images that were received were not quite the same as the images that were being sent. Um, but again, there's a, a telepathic influence of thought there. That's the, the, the vertical halluc hallucinations, as, as they call it. The second one is the telepathic apparitions. So these ways, like momentary clairvoyance, in that specific case, um, the person who is receiving the image for a certain moment kind of goes um, out of their, of their body, maybe is transported into the situation that's happening and is able to see clearly what's happening with the details of the clothes that the image is wearing, uh, issues in their body, and, and things like that. Um, 
And the third one is objective appearance. That's when there is an objective, almost tangible, if not tangible, uh, visible to everyone, materialized, where you can perceive the vision because the light is reflecting upon that and is being uh, registered with our physical eyes. Right. Let's go to um, the examples of those of those doubles. Uh, this is the third one, right? Through the whole book, uh, one thing that uh, caught my attention is that whenever he was talking, Delano was talking about these investigations, he was, again, always um, alluding to them not as absolute truth. They're always thinking the term, uh, being careful about saying that this, this experiment suggests uh, the evidence was leads to believe, I was close to the truth. Um, but in any ways, it was always, there was always an element that was being perceived related to the existence of this other astral body that was being used to, uh, for the images to, for the, for the people to show themselves and present themselves. Um, even further, these experiments, they give proof of the materiality of the apparitions. Because there are many cases where they can open a door, they can carry an object, they can speak, they can write. So the experiments go on to prove that in those cases, we don't have the telepathic theory. The agent is making an impression on the mind of the receptor. It's not making an impression on the mind of the receptor. There is an actual physical replica of the body, which brings a different perspective to the understanding of the external manifestation um, because of the mind. Because that would give proof of the existence of the thought and intelligence outside of our brain. That is saying that our soul is not a creation of our physical nerve cells. Um, right. Here I have a few examples of uh, what we call the doubles. Um, that's when, you know, the, the specific people, they were able to lift and, and, and create that Second image, uh, like the example that we saw of uh, Miss Emily Saji, have three examples here. Of course, pictures back then were not as they are today, but you can still clearly see um, some of those uh, doubles in, in the pictures. All right. One medium that participated in very various experiments um, about doubling or splitting uh, was Eusapia Palladino. Her experiments were studied for over 30 years by more than 50 scholars, um, different countries, different setups. Um, a lot of them used her to run experiments where she could uh, use, create casts in clay. Um, there was even a specific case where um, there's an account describing that um, the investigators that were present were holding the medium back where she was in a corner of the room and the casting um, area was in a completely opposite that she could never go there. But even with all of that, even though she was there motionless and inert, um, the casts were created to her image uh, in terms of face, hands, and so on. I think I have some pictures here as well. So we have, uh, that's a picture of her and have two of the casts that she created of herself in those cases. We're going to see that actually there was an, another experience with her. Um, you see below the, her face and the other one was her hands. But anyway, so there's a lot of different um, examples that Delaney brought to us about these uh, operations of the living. And he concludes this book one pretty much talking about what can be causes of false appearance. And he says, look, it can be illusion. You know, that's when you are, your body, your, your brain will not be functioning well. Uh, sometimes if half asleep, if you're in between sleeping and, and waking up and you see, you know, forms in, in the curtain or in the, in the shades. Second one is pathological hallucinations. Um, that's caused by something physical, like an overstrain, a heart condition that might affect your brain. Your brain. Suggested hallucination can be uh, doing hypnosis or maybe um, even auto-suggested. And the fourth one, the normal hallucinations, that's uh, work when you are um, overexcited or right after you wake up and you remember something you dreamt of, uh, things like that. 
But then he goes on to describe cause of real appearances. Again, not to say that every single time there's an appearance is necessarily real or not. And that's how he concludes his theory, that this is not takes away that there are um, you no know, false impressions, but there are real appearances. And those ones are, you know, odd ghosts. And what does it mean by that? It's just a physical and involuntary emanation from the subject, from the person. Clairvoyant apparition. Again, the subject sees a distant person or a scene, a bar clairvoyance. The third one is half-materialized apparition. That's when the apparition presents real characteristics unknown to the seer, like wounds, details of clothing. Um, the apparition is, is visible simultaneously or successively to several people. And a materialized apparition, that's uh, when they prove themselves by a mechanical action. So they can actually open a door, move objects, touch people, and so on. Up until now, this is all. This is how he concluded the first volume, looking at the apparitions of the living. All of those things kind of pave the way and give a lot of the base upon he will develop the second book, the second volume, which is the apparitions of the dead. Apparitions of the dead. I think uh, I will list here um, how to make sure. Again, he always goes back to how do I prove that. Everything that I'm seeing is not a hallucination. So here I have a few lists of things like the the, uh, the appearance has a scratch on the cheek. So those are those are details of, of cases that he goes through that will give us an indication that people are not just hallucinating because it would be a chance of one in I don't know how many, almost statistically impossible to know those things. The the first case, um, there was a, a, a mother, and there was a, a mother and a son, and uh, let me remind what this actually. So there was a man. He thought he had seen his uh, deceased sister, and he noticed that she had a cut in her face, and but he was he was very vivid. He was very sure it was her. He didn't talk or anything, but then he went on to talk to his parents about that, and he saw. His, his sister, and he was intrigued because he had, she had a cut in, in her face. Then his mother started to cry because she then talked, nobody knew about that. But she knew that after the girl had died, when she was preparing her to be uh, buried, by accident, she cut her uh, in the face and she covered it uh, with you know, makeup and stuff, so nobody even noticed. Um, and that was something that only was only new to her. I only known to her. Um, so again, to give an indication of he could have not just thought about that. Um, the ghost was dripping. A another case that somebody who saw a friend um, all of the sudden, that it, but he saw the image of the friend who was just so wet, dripping, and, and so on. And then he went to investigate and realized that, that the friend had just died, um, drowned um, in the same moment uh, in a different part of the city. And you have some other cases here. But in any ways, um, the, the list that he makes to assure, to make sure that uh, these are not hallucinations is, if it is known to the perceiver, the phantom shows there are particular signs um, that they didn't know. It could be wounds, scars, special clothing. Second one, the appearance is that of a person whom the subject had never seen before. That's a good one. Um, however, the description is sufficient precise to establish who the person was. Third one, the appearance gives information whose accuracy is subsequently recognized and is related to real fact, totally unknown to the person who saw it. Next one, we were able to obtain or accidentally or voluntarily photographs of the ghosts and could compare those. Several witnesses were simultaneously uh, affected or saw the same manifestation. You had animal and man perceive the apparition, reaction to the apparition. Um, then here we have another case um, because once we start talking about, we saw in the first book, it was possible for um, a living person to create 
this doubling to you know project this image then people would say well if this is true and a person can create this doubling then everything that's happening around that medium is a creation of their own medium their own medium is creating their doubling it's just their astral body and so on and that's when it started the discussion about the origin of visible forms um now It is a possibility that for a certain cases, the ghosts or the images they were seen by the med they were seen by the medium, they are not images um, of other spirits. I mean images they ha might have projected themselves. It is a possibility. However, as you go to investigate the examples again, you realize that all of these other items we were talking about in terms of uh, the stories, the characteristics, the the how they checked that these people are actually real and they went through specific experiences that the mediums they don't know um, so we started to go into the the, the the validation of the checks behind those apparitions um, that would give credit that those were not uh, a creation of the medium um, i have a case here that's the the images i brought is the portrait of mrs bonner so what happened was that this is in, in Boston, um, there was um, a specific uh, medium that um, he was doing a seance in, in his house and there was an appearance, it was take, he was trying to get pictures of the apparitions of spirits. And in one of the sessions, he took a picture and he finally got one. That's the picture on the left. But he did not recognize this person, he did not uh, know who they were. Um, and but he but the, he received a message saying that this was uh, the name of the person was Mrs. Bonner. He started to talk to people to understand if anybody around his circle knew anybody. Um, and then he met somebody who had heard about him, met a Mr. Bonner from Georgia um, in 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 a, in, a, in a few a few weeks, a few weeks that had passed. Then this person got in contact with this Mr. Bonner from Georgia, sent this information to him, and then the Mr. Bonner from Georgia actually contacted uh, the medium and said, "Okay, yeah, my wife, my wife has passed. Um, and he brought a picture of her, and that's the picture in the middle. So you can start to see like the similarities between the image they had in the left and the picture in the middle. Um, the husband while he was in Boston, what he said was he wrote, he knew that the, the wife wanted to give him a message based on the, the apparition. Then he wrote to another medium, separate one, a very long letter with specific questions um, directed at his wife. This other medium called Dr. Flint, he was used to receive letters uh, for deceased people and he would receive answers and then give to people. Mr. Bonner, the, the widow husband, uh, received an answer with the detailed instructions to go to the mediums uh, of the photography again on a specific day, that she would appear in a picture with him, holding a wreath of flowers, wearing um, the, the, the hidden in her head, and the other hand would be pointing to the sky. She, he did the same. He went to the photograph uh, medium again, and everything happened as was described in this other letter from a different medium, had nothing to do with this, about uh, that situation that day. In all the examples, before, during, or after death, the phenomena present such analogies that they must be considered as being of the same order. They show themselves under the same aspect, they have identical characteristics, they act in the same way, uh, either by clairvoyance or optically. So, logically, we need to attribute them to the same cause, which is the extracorporeal action of the human soul. Um, Munir, I, you know you're going to kill me, but I'm going to try to, to rush to the end and we can have some time to have some uh, conversation. Um, no in the same way that the line... <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. I'm, I'm going to power through. It's just, the books are just so long, but it's just so many ex uh, examples. It's really interesting. Um, anyways, in the same way that the line structured the... Uh, his volume one. Volume two also organized voluntary experiments after these um, involuntary operations. 
And he described multiple experiments. And I bring another case here. That is the hands that appear during session. Um, they happen in Committee of the Dialectical Society by me, Mr. Benjamin Coleman. Um, so let me read here for you. Mr. Holm, who was in our midst, expressed the opinion that we should hold a seance because he said he had a presentiment that something remarkable was going to happen. He had played with children in the garden, had braided a crown of flowers, and he put him in his hat. And he, they went to the living room. Um, and the living room was the same level as the garden. He got you know, moved around the books, carpet, and so on, the central table. And there was seven, the, same, the table that was, there could be seven people. Um, the seven people occupied the, the quarters, uh, three quarters of the table, leaving free the fourth um, towards the window. The moon gave enough light to allow us to see each other, as well as the objects placed between us and the window. I asked Mr. Holm to place his two hands in, on mine, which he did, and I continued to hold them during the whole course of the session. After a series of ordinary phenomena, Mr. Holm suddenly exclaimed, Look, they're taking the crown off my head. We all saw the crown floating gently around us without anything supporting it. It came above me, I seized it and placed it on my head for several weeks. It remained in my possession. The table gradually rose in the air. Soon we were all obliged to stand, and as it continued to rise until it touched the ceiling, it found itself beyond the reach of all of us, except me, who was the tallest of all. It then descended gently and resumed its original place, making no more noise than the fall of a snowflake. A bell was placed on the table, and the hand and arm of a female proportion seemed to rise from the light end of the table, move towards the bell, pick it up, wave it, and then remove it from view. A moment later, I felt a hand land on my knee. I put my hand in there and I received the bell, which I replaced on the table. I then asked if to be allowed to touch the hand. I advanced my quite open under the table and I felt a gentlewoman's hand resting on it, which then withdrew slowly. As we were all able to see and remark, the arm was draped in a kind of gauze sleeve through which the shape showed distinctly. distinctly. Three of four or four people in the company wore rings on their fingers. One of them said, someone just took my, the ring off my finger. Another said, mine too. And the fourth rings were thus removed. Immediately, a hand showed itself presenting the four rings on its fingers then it disappeared and the rings were thrown on the table. Again, in the same seance, it was different people, different uh, backgrounds, not necessarily dedicated to um, these studies, and you described all of the same um, effects um, at the same time. I'm not going to read through all of this, um, but... Um, there was a specific session organized in Milan. So the, all of these experiments and investigations were happening all over Europe. And they organized a specific session. They brought mediums and investigators in Italy. And they organized 17 sessions um, by Azakov. And in those sessions, they had a lot of different um, experiments. I have 12 of the, the different phenomena and, and situation they they went through like transportation of objects knocks on door sensible pops of hair contacts of hands in the mysterious figure clapping of hands anyways a lot of different things happened again with scientists people investigating and giving the validity that the experiment was as controlled as possible i'm going to go back here quickly to talk about animism is something that uh it comes up uh, frequently. And we were talking about, again, if the medium is able to create its double, sterilize that and act um, as a, an, another element, another body, what guarantees us then that those uh, elements, those experiences are not um, a consequence of the medium's will? Which again, it's a very valid question. And in many cases, it might be. However, just because it might be, it doesn't mean that that's the case everywhere. And how do we know that? Because through the experiments, they started to see a lot of productions, a lot of um, 
proof that either the content, the language, the details, the identity of the people that were being presented in their appearances, or they were writing, or they were talking about, was outside the possibilities of the medium. Languages they didn't know, some of the mediums um, were quite illiterate, and they, they were still writing and sending messages, or the writing was just appearing in specific in, in, in paper, outside their capabilities or their knowledge. So the intellectual side of it started to prove that this wasn't just a reflection of the medium, um, medium's will. Um, this is another picture from Eusapia Paladino. Remember that one that I showed that in the first volume, when, um, when the line was talking about <clears throat> the apparitions of the living, Eusapia Paladino was a medium that was studied a lot. She participated in a lot of things. And she was the one that was used to create the casts of her own face and her own hands. She was also used in different um, experiments where she was able to provide the energy and provide the matter that was then manipulated by the spirits. And those new casts were created, but now they were casts of completely different people, different faces, different hands, different size of uh, feet. Again, how would it be possible for her to create those uh, perfect shapes of different people? It wasn't. Um, we also go through the Sir William Crookes, and there are plenty of books of his experiments uh, with Katie King and the spirit of Katie King using Florence Cook as a medium. He pretty much took in Florence Cook uh, into his house, his, him and his wife, to run experiments in a super controlled environment in his house. And there were years and years of apparitions with Katie King that he described in his um, book, books. Um, I think I'm going to pass this one. I think we'll just go to the next one. Otherwise, I'm not going to have time to have a chat. And we get to the conclusions. I brought only three conclusions here. But again, the book is just so vast. It's just so many different cases described in detail. But the end is... Um, if you see all of that happening from people who are alive, people who have passed, uh, one thing is just imposing, which is the immortality of the soul. Um, and the immortality of the soul that we exist outside of the body and outside of our mind, that imposes a lot of questions uh, from a religious perspective, from a philosophical perspective, um, because now these, because of the effects and the phenomena, this existence leaves those perspectives and now it goes into science. There's a phenomena here that can be explained, that can be experimented. Independence of the soul. Again, the soul exists outside of the body and independent of the body. Um, we see um, the doubles or the spirits doing things, having conversations, being very independent. Um, Third one is the perspective, this element that the astral body or the fluidic body, it's called many different ways, um, that we carry with us and we use it to um, create those effects and manipulate and show ourselves and manipulate matter on the other side. Uh, the main conclusion is that spiritism is not a religion, it's a science of the day after death. And the, the scientific... Um, value of it, the, the, the fruitful scientific value of it. Um, it's not just about understanding how things work on the other side, but there's a moral and social consequence as well, because once we accept and we understand all of these things, then the next step is how should that affect the way I live my life? He doesn't get into that in this book. This book is just dedicated to investigating the phenomena in the multiple um places. This is it. Um, Munir, I spoke a lot. Didn't leave us a lot of, a lot of time. But they are no very problem. long books, but there's a lot of examples. It's, it's great. Thank you very much indeed, Rafael. I know that you had, you've had a, a hard job you know, to take two books, two very important ones, because some people consider the masterpieces of um, Gabriel Delan. And why do I say that? Because we have the work by Alan Kardec, information brought by spirits. But we could say that Kardec was more just like the theoretical physicists. 
Wright's theory yeah. explains the laws, bringing some example, but the experimental spiritists, in my view, was Gabriel Delan, yeah. because he used the scientific methods to go through all the phenomena related to, you know, the apparitions in this case, living and, and dead. And he showed us in, in a very uh, scientific, methodological way. And it's not very common to see that because we find books where people talk about the apparitions. Sometimes they even give a general explanation, but to prove that, you know, it is real or it can be real and why it can be real, you know, it's, it's a tremendous work. And it's very important that, you know, we, uh, because as far as I know, we have the, the books in French, they were written originally in French. We have most, if not all of them, translated to Portuguese. But I can remember if we have, you know, books, these books translated into English, or if we do, we have very few of them. So it's important for people who don't speak neither French nor Portuguese to get to know uh, Delan's work and see the amount of information that we find there, especially in relation to the what we I call experimental uh, spiritism. And it's important because people in general, we, I include myself, we have our faith of beliefs. And when we are told or when we read about one apparition or one of these, uh, I would call spiritual phenomenon, we either accept it because it's nice, it's interesting, you know, it, it's good for us to believe in that, or we reject because of our faith, because we don't want, we don't like that idea, you know. <laughs> I always remember my mother was raised a Catholic, Catholic. She got, got to know Spiritism. She, you know, read many Spiritist books, but she didn't like the idea of reincarnation because she said, oh, we have a hard life. And when I die, I have to come back and face it all over again. And I said, no, each one, you know, is always in conjunction with the others to, you know, improve you and to, uh, when, when most of us, we say, oh, I'm very comfortable where I am. I don't want to accept this. This is rubbish. This is fake. This is, you know, it's not, not such a thing as apparitions. And, but when we start to pay attention in a very serious way to it, and then we realize, yes, you know, there's so much information. There are so many examples. Then we change our belief. Then we believe in what we see and what we can explain, not what, you know, is convenient uh, for us. Yeah. And that's why, you know, it's nice that you took all this time to talk about these two books. You know, it's very, very important. It's it's funny because, well, as I was reading the the two books, a lot of the examples that he gives, we hear, in, as we go through life, you hear somebody, you know, a friend or a family member say, oh, this happened or this happened. You know, I woke up in the middle of the night and then I, I have this case in my family. I remember uh, one of my family members saying, oh, so weird. Tonight I woke up, it was like 2 a.m. And I saw this person who I worked with 10 years ago came and said uh, thank you and goodbye. And then throughout the day, they, they received the news that the person had passed. They didn't even know that the person was ill. They, did not, they hadn't talked to the person like in ages. And they happened. So those things start to, they are always there. But a lot of us don't even take time to like investigate, understand, or even are curious enough to see oh, what's behind it. Is it possible? Is it not? How does it work? So a lot of the examples that he gives, we identify, oh, yeah, actually, I've heard so many cases like this. But in every single chapter, he always brings the, the question itself. It's not his, he's not trying to prove us, or oh, this is what I believe. It is like, these are the things that could explain. And this is how we understand that this is not a hallucination or something like that. And I think that's the, the value of, of the reflection that he is, is bringing to us. It's just like, how can I always ask and question myself? Does it make sense? Is it happening? Why it's happening? How can I be sure about these things and so on? So it's, it's fascinating. It's, it's really like a, a brilliant work. Yeah, you know, because sometimes you say, oh, some people are sort of, um, excuse my word, but ignorant about things, about science and about spiritism. And they have their own opinion and they believe in, in their opinion. But I would say also, 
scientists and even some spiritists they they are also ignorant of the other side you know a scientist a medical doctor may very easily say a psychiatrist oh this is hallucination yes it can be hallucination but if you are actually following a scientific procedure you will check to see if it is yeah. really hallucination if you can check you say well it can be but I'm not 100% sure that this is the case. Exactly. And Delan is very good at doing that because he proves what can be proved, but he does not reject because he can prove one case, he rejects you know, the exactly. other options you know, for the, uh, as explanation for, for those um, phenomena. And also spiritists, sometimes they want to believe, oh, this is a spirit, this is spiritual manifestation, no, this is... And when you go to see, well, it may not be as well. It may be just a physical manifestation, a normal manifestation of the physical world. You know, it has a physical explanation for that. So we, we should bear that in mind. We shouldn't discard things or accept things. And I go back to the first slide. We shouldn't either accept everything or reject everything because it doesn't require any effort from us to check. Yeah. Exactly. If you want to check, you always say, okay, let's see if it's A or if it's B or if it's C, you know. Very, very good indeed. Thank you so much, Rafael. No worries, my pleasure. Good. So time is up. Here we go now. I'll just make some announcements before we go. So next month, the 6th of August, we have here with us talking about another work by Gabriel Delan, um, documented evidence for study of reincarnation. And we have with us Dr. Humberto Schubert Coelho. So he'll be with us talking about another masterpiece, I would say, by Gabriel Delan. And just a quick reminder that we have on Wednesdays our study group. It's an online study group. We study Heaven and Hell and the Gospel According to Spiritism. These two books by Alan Kardec. It's every Wednesday, 12 um, p.m. Um, lunchtime, uh, 12 noon, UK time, London time. So if you are in another country, just check your local time so you're most welcome to join us we also have every saturday the study of the mediums book coordinated by guilherme diaz myself and charles kemp this is a very interesting study as we say is a study group as well so everyone has the opportunity to uh ask questions and interact so um it's a very good opportunity actually to study the mediums book there's nothing ready-made. We just, you know, read the text and then open for discussion. And we have people from all over the world because it's online. It is easier for people to join and participate. So every Saturday, 10 a.m. UK time. So you're also most welcome to join us. And finally, we want to thank Kardec Radio for lending us the studio without the um wonderful help this program wouldn't be possible not in this in this way so thank you very much to Kardec radio so that was it i hope to see you all next uh, month first sunday of the month and so for the moment goodbye see you all in a month time and thank you so much rafael thank bye you bye. Bye, bye everyone bye bye